Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new, welcome. Today's video is going to be the last video of Solved September. I'm really sad that Solved September is ending, but don't worry, October is going to be really exciting. I have a lot of things planned, but for the last video of Solved September, I feel like I picked a good case to cover because this case is important for a lot of reasons, and it's not as talked about on YouTube as I personally feel like it should be. This case really shook America when it happened and everybody was kind of affected by it, everybody had an opinion about it, and everybody just came together and tried so hard. And it was the first time you ever really saw that from the entire country because of the way that this case was spread. It was basically the first case that was spread using the internet. I hope that you do decide to stick around for the entire video because this case definitely is one that deserves to be heard. So with all that being said, let's just get into it. Polly Hannah Class was born January 23rd, 1981 in Fairfax, California to parents Eve Nickel and Mark Class. In 1993, she was 12 years old, a sweet girl with an over-the-top personality. She lived with her mother and younger sister Annie in Petaluma, California, only about 40 miles north of San Francisco. She enjoyed performing in school plays. It was a passion of hers, so much that she actually dreamed of becoming an actress when she grew up. Unfortunately, getting to grow up was stolen from her on October 1st of that year, only a few months before she would have been a teenager. On the evening of October 1st, 1993, Polly and her friend Jillian Pelham were waiting outside Polly's home for their other friend, Kate McLean, and Kate finally showed up with her mother around 8.30. They were planning this huge slumber party. They were so excited for it. They had all these snacks ready. They were planning on staying up all night laughing and having a good time but that is far from what happened. It was three young girls having a sleepover, so obviously they were going to make a bit of noise. At around 9.45, Polly's mother popped in to tell them to just keep it down a little bit because she was getting ready to go to bed and she had a severe migraine. Polly's mother's bedroom was right across the hall from Polly's. She knew they were having fun, so the chances of them keeping their voices low for more than a few minutes was slim. So she decided to simply take some prescription sleeping pills to help her get to sleep fast and sleep through the noise. The slumber party continued for about another hour after her mother decided to go to sleep. They were just having a great time, enjoying each other's company, and a majority of the time they were actually putting on makeup. And they were putting on makeup to look scary because they were practicing different looks because Halloween was in less than a month and one of the looks that they tried out on Polly they were smudging black around her eyes and making her look dead which is very very spine chilling to think about of course they had no idea at the time and they were just having fun but it's, it's very hard to think about the fact that they tried to make her look dead and what happened next. This is around the time when the night took a horrible turn. Polly decided that she was going to go get the sleeping bags so they could get more comfortable and when she opened her bedroom door there was a man standing there. He was just standing there. He had crept past Polly's mother while she was in her deep sleep. He was holding a knife and a duffel bag and told them that if they screamed he was going to slit their throats. This man, at first, to Polly's friends, didn't look menacing. They weren't afraid at first. They honestly, like I said, because Halloween was right around the corner, they thought that it was some sort of a prank. Maybe it was somebody Polly knew, somebody in her family. They planned this entire thing and were going to scare them, but they realized pretty quickly that it wasn't a joke because they looked at Polly and Polly was absolutely terrified. He started tying the girls' hands behind their backs. He was calm at first, simply asking them questions like which girl's house it was and if there was anyone else in the house at the time. The girls at this point were crying and he told them that he wasn't going to hurt any of them, that he only wanted money. But the strange thing is that Polly told him where a jewelry box was and he didn't even try to get it. He duct taped their mouths shut and he went and grabbed pillowcases off of some of Polly's pillows and he put the pillowcases over Jillian and Kate's heads 
and he told them to count to a thousand. He said that by the time they got to a thousand, Polly would be back in the room and he would be gone. After he left, about 20 minutes later, they finally managed to free themselves and they quickly ran around Polly's entire home to see if she was anywhere. She wasn't, so they decided to wake up her mother and they woke her up in a complete panic. Petaluma police were called immediately and arrived in no time. They looked around the room and could tell that obviously something had happened there because video game cords had been cut and things were sprawled all around the room. A detective named Ed Fryer became the lead investigator on this case. He had a lot of history working on abduction cases and was familiar with the area, but he knew this one might be a bit harder to crack because it seemed like it was a stranger abduction case. It didn't really seem like she had been taken by someone who knew her or her family in any way, just someone who decided to commit a crime that night and chose the home at random. Stranger abduction cases really are the hardest abduction cases to solve because there's nothing really connecting the victim to them besides them being their victim. There's no strings to attach to try to find them. They knew according to Jillian and Kate that this man did not try to hide his face at all, he wasn't wearing a mask, so they decided to bring them in and talk to a sketch artist and try to get a sketch done of what this man possibly looked like. For about two hours, Jillian and Kate gave every detail of what the man looked like from what they could remember to a sketch artist. Police were working very hard and very quickly because they did believe it was a stranger abduction case. And when it comes to stranger abduction cases, most of the time the victim is usually harmed in some way or unfortunately killed within the first 24 hours. So time was everything in this case. And also speaking of time, the word of her abduction spread very, very, very fast. Over the next two months, over 4,000 people helped in the search for Polly Class, and it became nationwide news. It was on the cover of magazine after magazine and newspaper after newspaper. Television shows like 2020 and America's Most Wanted covered her case. They truly went above and beyond for this case. They even brought in an evidence response team, and they went over that room with a fine tooth comb. They were using the most advanced forensic technology at the time. The crazy thing is police couldn't find one fingerprint in Polly's room. The evidence response team though, using a fluorescent powder and an ultraviolet light, were able to pick up over four dozen fingerprints, all of them belonging to either Polly or one of her family members. They did happen to find a palm print though, most likely when the intruder leaned against the bed to support himself while grabbing the pillows to use the pillowcases. You're probably thinking, wow, they have a whole palm print. They're definitely going to find this guy. But this was 1993, and the database that they were using at the time only had fingerprints. So there's nothing really they could do with this because the palm print that they had was only from here down. They didn't have any print of his actual fingers. So all they could do was keep it on file and compare it to a suspect's palm print and see if there was a match. Petaluma police then decided to go to Polly's school to talk to teachers, fellow students, janitors, anyone who might have any information regarding the case. They also scoured the neighborhood to see if any of her neighbors heard or saw anything strange the night of her abduction. Several people came forward claiming they saw a stranger in the neighborhood lurking around that fit the description of the kidnapper. One of those people was a boy named Thomas who said that around 9 o'clock on the night of her abduction, him and two friends were walking to the video store when they passed by Polly's house. They saw a man standing into the darkness on the side of her home. They thought that this was strange, obviously, but kept walking. On their way back, he was still there. These boys lived in the neighborhood and basically knew everyone around. This was someone that they were not familiar with. Seeing him standing there like that gave them a weird feeling, so they hurried past her house as fast as possible. They didn't show Thomas a sketch of what the abductor looked like, they just asked him to give a description of what the guy looked like who was lurking around that night, and the description that he gave was pretty much the sketch to a T. Hundreds upon hundreds of people were looking for her just in Petaluma at this time. They formed the Polly Class Search Center and searched day after day. They were determined to find Polly and who was responsible for taking her. People had a lot of faith when it came to this case, especially at first, but people were terrified and were completely shocked. 
it especially affected the mental state of parents. Parents were making sure their doors were locked at night and were even making their kids sleep in their bedrooms because this man was still on the loose and they didn't know when he was going to strike again. The thing that really had people shaken up was that she wasn't taken on her way to school or on her way to the store or the library or out at the park with friends where she was out in the open. She was taken from her home, from the comfort of her own home, the place where she should feel safest. And her mother was right across the hall. That is what really scared people. And this was not a town where this kind of violence happened. People were not used to hearing about this, especially back then. One thing about Polly's case is that her case was the first case that was really primarily spread around using the internet. This had never really been done before. 1993 was the dawn of the internet superhighway and they used this to their advantage. Polly's missing persons poster was spread online and received a far wider distribution than any missing persons poster before. Over 54 million Advo flyers were sent nationwide with Polly's picture and the kidnapper sketch and a title that read, Have You Seen Us? There were hotlines set up for tips. Some came in, but most of the people calling were parents who had missing children as well and wanted help finding theirs. They wanted to talk to Polly's parents, help find Polly, and help find their own children. It sort of became a force. There were so many people trying to help and trying to get help, and everybody was kind of connected through their trauma. And within no time, Polly was given the name America's Child. That's the kind of impact that her kidnapping had. I mean, everybody cared. America cared. Police were still working constantly and made another discovery. They picked up fibers on Polly's carpet that they found while using an electrostatic dust print machine that didn't match the fibers on her carpet. They were from elsewhere, most likely the interior carpet of a vehicle. They compared the fibers that they found to carpet fibers found in all of Polly's family members' vehicles. There was no match there, so they figured that the fibers came from the abductor when he came in that night and that he possibly brought them in on his shoes. They also found a piece of hair that had been forcibly pulled out of someone's scalp. They could tell it had been forcibly pulled out because it had a tiny microscopic bit of scalp connected to it, which is what happens when hair is yanked out. This was 1993 though, and DNA testing wasn't perfected yet, so they couldn't really do much with this either. Like I said before, they didn't really think that they could do much with this print of the abductor's palm, but after examining it longer, they did realize that there was a great bit of detail in the ridges, so they were going to attempt to photograph it. When they photographed it, it came up because of the lighting and everything coming through because it was just a scan. It came up orange on a black background, so they had to mess around with it and kind of reverse the colors, and they finally got it to black on a white background, which is what you have to have when you file a print of any sort. So they finally had a good copy now of the abductor's palm print to compare to the abductor when they finally catch him. Around this time, Polly's father received a phone call from someone who sounded just like Polly. The girl said that they were Polly and they were in a hotel room somewhere, they didn't know where, and that the kidnapper had left the room for a moment and they were able to get to a phone. Then the line went flat. They couldn't trace the phone call because police weren't ready at the time to try to trace it. They were going to be ready though when the girl decided to ever call back. The FBI were ready to trace back the next call. They stood around waiting with Mark Class and they finally got a call. The girl indeed sounded like Polly and acted like she couldn't really talk long. They traced the location though in that short amount of time to a house about 30 miles away. You really have to put yourself in her father's shoes. He thought that she was still alive out there and he really, really wanted to believe that he was talking to his daughter on the phone but it wasn't his daughter. It was just a random teenage girl who was dared by her friends to call. It was just a joke. And this just broke Mark class. He had so much faith that she was still alive out there and now he was starting to think she might be gone. Then they decided with the passing of a few weeks, maybe Jillian and Kate would be a little bit more calmed down by now 
and they could bring them in to develop a second, maybe more detailed sketch of the man. This sketch was definitely a bit more detailed and now they were not so as emotionally shaken up. They were able to give much more information to the sketch artist. This new sketch artist was also more skilled when it came to getting as much detail as possible out of the people being questioned. This new sketch of the man was distributed in hopes that someone would be able to recognize him this time for sure. I can't stress it enough how many people tried to help. I mean, they even had the Navy looking for her. People were just outraged and exhausted and just wanted to find her. On November 28th, 1993, a woman named Dana Jaffe, about 20 miles from Petaluma, notified police that she found something strange on her property. She led an officer down a wooded path and showed them what she found. She found a piece of silk cloth ripped into what looked like a hood, packing tape, and a pair of girls' tights that were tied into a knot with human hair caught in the knot. She told the officer that she remembered a trespasser on her property about two months earlier. She said that her babysitter that she had hired for the night was leaving after her shift and she was driving down her driveway. It was a very long driveway. It was a huge private property and she saw a man on the side of the driveway stuck. The babysitter decided that she was going to roll down the window just a little bit, see if the guy needed any help and she could tell right off the bat this is somebody she should not be messing with because according to the babysitter, he looked like a wild man. He was just all over the place and sweating and dirty and very frantic and he insisted that she help him and she just said that she couldn't and she rolled up the window and kept driving. She found a payphone and called her employer to notify her what had happened and the fact that there was a strange man trespassing on her property. As soon as Dana heard, she was not playing around. She grabbed her daughter because she was not going to leave her daughter in the home by herself with this strange man loose on the property. And she grabbed a baseball bat, got in her car, and started driving down her driveway to find this man and confront him and see why he was on her property. This was a private property. There's no reason he should be there. She drove down the driveway, saw his car stuck, but didn't see him. She wasn't going to get out and start looking for him, so she decided to just keep driving and notify police. Police came to her property, located the man, and he was just like the babysitter said. He looked very out there. He had been drinking, he had leaves and dirt in his hair, and he was sweating like he just ran a marathon. He told police he was, quote, sightseeing and had no idea it was private property, and that when he realized it was, he attempted to turn around and his car got stuck. Police knew after talking to this man for a few minutes that he was up to something and he was not telling the entire truth because when they asked him what he had been doing, he said that his car was obviously stuck and he was underneath the car earlier trying to fix it. Now, the way the car was positioned, it was kind of stuck on a little bit of a hill, so there was no way that a grown man or even a piece of paper could fit underneath that car, so police knew that he was lying about this. They gave him a roadside sobriety test. He weirdly passed the sobriety test, and then they looked in his vehicle, and he had tons of beer cans in it and a duffel bag. Well, this man was getting upset with the officers. They asked him if he was drinking that night and he actually opened up a beer right in front of them and began drinking it. Then of course they made him pour it out. They ended up patting him down, found nothing, they checked his license, it was clean, so they helped him pull his car out and they let him go. Of course police had no idea at the time, but they let Polly Class's killer go the night that she was killed. The man that they talked to that night was a man named Richard Allen Davis. They looked through his file. In 1976, he was arrested for robbery, kidnapping, and assault with intent to commit rape. In 1978, he was arrested for another kidnapping, assault with a weapon, and a few other charges. But to top it all off, he had been recently paroled for an eight-year sentence for kidnapping. The last arrest photo that they had on file looked exactly like the sketch of Polly's abductor. They knew this was their man. First thing they decided to do was compare the cloth that they found in the woods on Dana Jaffe's property to the cloth found in 
Polly's bedroom after her abduction. Now the cloth was a kind of stretchy, silky nightgown material, something kind of like a slip that you would put under a skirt and it had definitely been cut with scissors because it was very precise and they lined it up and it matched perfectly. When Richard was arrested, he was stopped by an officer who checked his license, saw who he was, and realized that he was being looked for by police, so he called in backup. When they arrested him, they didn't want him to know why they really needed to bring him in, so they told him that they were bringing him in because of violation of his parole. They calmly arrested him. At this time, he had no idea they knew about his involvement in Polly's abduction. They decided that they were going to do a police lineup and they brought in the only people who had seen Polly's abductor besides Polly and that was Jillian and Kate. They brought in three men in the police lineup and one of those men was Richard. As soon as Jillian and Kate saw Richard, their faces just dropped. They knew that this was the man that they saw that night and they told authorities this is the man who came into Polly's home that night this is the man who abducted Polly. They asked Richard about Polly's abduction and he said that he had no involvement, he didn't know what they were talking about, that he was completely innocent. They then compared a print of Richard's palm to the palm print found in Polly's room and it was a 100% match. So at this point, Richard was being held in isolation. Authorities went to him and said, buddy, we have a strong case against you, so just come clean. He still insisted that he had no involvement. Then one of his friends came in to talk to him. He sat down and talked to him on the phone through the glass, and of course the phone calls were recorded. This friend told Richard to just tell police where Polly was. Richard still insisted, knowing he was being recorded, that he had no involvement in Polly's abduction at all. His friend let him know about the newspaper article that stated that they matched his print to the print found in her room. He knew at the second that there was no way he could wiggle himself out of this, so he decided to just tell authorities what happened on the night of October 1st, 1993. He claimed that he had been recently living in some sort of a halfway house. He was trying to find his mother's house in Petaluma where she lived, couldn't find it, and had way too many beers that night. He ended up in Polly's neighborhood. He said he was offered marijuana by a man on the street, bought it, then went to the store for more beer. He had the intention of committing some crime that night because he did prepare. He had the tape, the bag, and the cloth pre-cut. He chose Polly's home at random. He did not know who Polly was. He had not been stalking her or her family. He just chose the house out of any other house on the street, and he got into the house through an open window. He said at this point he completely blacked out and when he finally came to he was driving in his vehicle and he saw Polly next to him. He didn't know who this girl was and she was scared obviously and crying and said that her wrists were going numb and they were tingling because they were tied together so tight. He said at this moment he didn't really know what to do with her next. He then drove the car off the path and that's where he got stuck. He said that once he realized the car was stuck, he carried Polly up the embankment. He originally planned to just leave her there until he got his car unstuck. He then brought police to where he dumped her body, in Cloverdale, California, about 50 miles north of Petaluma. She was found in a shallow grave. They determined her cause of death was strangulation. And that's when the babysitter came and then the police, and he said that after the police helped him get unstuck, he waited in a location for about 15 minutes and then he went back to get Polly. He said that he drove around with Polly in the car for a bit of time and he didn't really know what to do with her. He didn't think that he could just drop her off because she had seen his face. So he decided at that point that he had to get rid of her and that's exactly what he did. A candle burned in Polly's room every day that she was missing, and after nine weeks, after her body was finally found, the candle was blown out. The case didn't actually go to trial until 1996, and after 10 weeks, he was found guilty on 10 different counts. Now, during the entire trial, though, he was very disruptive, uncooperative, and taunted Polly's entire family, but especially her father. I'm not going to include this clip in this video, but I will include it down below in the description. And they let Richard 
address Polly's family and say anything he wanted to say to her family. And it's a very short clip, but what he decided to say is so disgusting. This man was just horrible. I mean, he's an evil, evil person. Richard Allen Davis currently sits on death row in San Quentin State Prison. As for Polly, her remains were spread over the Pacific Ocean by her friends and her family, and just like them, all of America grieved. During the search for Polly, even former Petaluma Junior High School student actress Winona Ryder offered a $200,000 reward for anyone who could help locate Polly class. This right here is a photo of her being comforted by Polly's grandfather after she was told that Polly's body had been found. Winona also starred in the film Little Women, which she dedicated to Polly because it had been one of her favorite books. A strange thing that I have to mention is that while Polly was in junior high, there was a teacher who actually told her that she reminded them of a former student, and that former student was Winona Ryder. And this made Polly so, so happy because she wanted to be an actor so bad and Winona was such a big actress at the time and she thought that she could possibly have a future like hers. This case really, really affected Winona Ryder. I mean, it's the reason that for a while in the early 90s, she didn't do any dramatic parts because she was just so emotionally exhausted and devastated over Polly's case that she couldn't handle a part that she had to tap too much into her emotions. This case is truly so, so important. I mean, of course, it should have never happened in a million years, but because of it, there have been so many changes and improvements made when it comes to handling abduction cases. Paulie's father has dedicated his life after his daughter's death to advocate for ways to help prevent similar crimes, such as Megan's Law, which requires sex offenders to register where they live, and the Amber Alert System. For instance, California's Three Strikes Law was signed because of this case, and the Poly Class Foundation was formed. This is an amazing organization. They have done so much for so many people. If you do want to learn more about the Poly Class Foundation, I will link their website down below in the description. Well, I think that Poly would be really, really proud of the work that we're doing. And with his organization, Class Kids, he continues to assist families of missing persons by helping to organize large-scale search operations. Every aspect of this case is just completely heartbreaking, down to even the teenagers daring their friend to call her father and pretend to be her. It's just so, I don't, I don't care what age you are, you know that that is horrible to do. There's no excuse for that. When it comes to Richard Allen Davis, this man, I don't even want to say man because everything he embodies is not of a man, like it's barely a human. I don't even want to say human, I don't want to say animal because that's offensive to animals. I guess waste is the best way to describe him, just a waste of a human. He should have been behind bars since the first crime he committed. I mean, he had a history of kidnapping. He attempted kidnapping so many times, attempted rape, burglary, robbery, I, I mean, this man obviously should not have been let out on the streets after so many charges. And if he was just sitting behind bars and doing the time that he deserved, Holly Class would still be alive. Let me know what you think about this case down below in the comments. I love reading through the comments and hearing your guys' opinions on everything. And I will see you guys next month in October. I am so excited for October. It's probably the month that I'm most looking forward to when it comes to videos and the ideas that I have. So stay tuned for that. And if you're not already, definitely make sure to hit that subscribe button and like the video if you like these kinds of videos and of course want me to do more. And I will see you guys in my next one. Bye guys.